So what if I told you that dogs are not pack animals? This sounds crazy, right? Like you heard dogs referred to as pack animals a million times. It, it feels like a very basic fact about dogs. And it's just, it's just one of those little things that we take for granted, right? Plus, you know what you've seen in your own life. So why am I sitting here trying to convince you that it's not true? Uh, well, <laughs> dogs are a unique species, like humans, and as such, they don't always fit neatly into these labels that humans have for, uh, for categorizing different species of animals. Um, and because labels like pack animal um, actually do disservice to dogs, it's worth dissecting the idea and and just making some important distinctions. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Jennifer Malloway, dog trainer, behavior consultant, now Mythbuster, <laughs> um, here to help you have a more magical relationship with your dog. Uh, so let's let's break it down. And along the way, of course, if you guys have questions or thoughts, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, I I hope for this to be uh, a discussion because. That's, that's the fun of it, right? Um, and, and a well, big welcome to Jesse and Scott and CK. Thank you guys for saying hi and for being here. Um, hopefully you find this stuff as interesting as I do. Um, so, okay, so what, let's start with what is, what is a pack animal, actually? Uh, a pack animal is a species that lives and hunts as a group. Um, that's, that's simple. <laughs> um, and dogs have evolved alongside humans and are genetically predisposed to bond very closely with us. Uh, but bonding with another species is not the same as living as a pack. Um, and dogs also are under no illusion that we are dogs. Um, I hear people ask that all the time. You know, does my dog think I'm a dog? They absolutely do not. <laughs> um, and hi, Sarah. Welcome, welcome. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, so classifying dogs as a pack animal based on them often often living among humans is is pretty far off base. There's that doesn't really give us the foundation we need to call them a pack animal. Um, welcome, construction cronies. Uh, no worries. Work gets busy. Do what you got to do, man. <laughs> and Karen, welcome. You guys are, nobody's late. You're all on time. This is amazing. So glad to have you here. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, yeah. And, and um, before I continue, uh, from, from here on out, it, it's probably important for me to be very specific about the fact that when I say dogs, uh, I am referring to Canis familiaris, the, the one that lives with you, the one that we're all familiar with, um, and not any other species of dogs, because there are several, and they are different. Um, so there, there, are, there are groups of feral dogs, um, De feral, de, you know, <laughs> it's, I feel weird um, using those in the same sentence, but they're Canis familiaris, but they're feral. They live on their own uh, without the care of humans. There are populations of dogs in the world, and they give us an opportunity to study what, what dog behavior would look like uh, without human intervention. Um, and studies of those populations have shown that dogs don't actually form packs. They, um, they might congregate temporarily around a food source or around a female in heat, maybe, or just when it's convenient or advantageous for them to do so. Um, but when that resource is no longer there, the dogs disperse and go about their way. Um, they don't, they don't generally live and travel and hunt together, which as we've already stated, is the definition of a pack animal. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, actually, uh, our domesticated dogs aren't even truly hunters. Um, yes, yes, they do have uh, some of that residual hunting 
behavioral software left over from their wolf ancestors. Um, but due to domestication and artificial selection, uh, those genetic behavioral sequences are in pieces and, and incomplete. Um, the domesticated dog is actually uh, more of a forager or a scavenger than a real, a true hunter. Um, uh, hello, Jackie. Uh, I am good, you guys. I'm doing all right today. It's the, the sun is out. Dizzy's been able to go to the park. It's been a good, it's been a good few days. Uh, Scott has a question. So are there exceptions? I have often seen groups of stray dogs hanging together. Um, yeah, and, and Scott, so that's, that's kind of what I mean is that um, you may often see uh, dogs hanging around each other. Usually that's because there's some, there's something in the environment, uh, a resource that's, that's drawing them together. Um, but they don't, they don't necessarily like go back and, you know, share a den, things like that. Um, and I'm not saying that there couldn't be exceptions, but from, from the known populations of, of feral dogs that we, that we have evidence from, uh, generally they don't choose to do that. Um, and welcome say, hello, hello. Oh, you guys are great. This is awesome. Um, so, uh, so yeah, absolutely. There could be exceptions. Um, as, as I said before, you know, dogs, dogs bond closely with us and it is possible that they might bond closely with other dogs. Um, but it's, yeah, there, well, there's, there's more to it. We're, we're heading in that direction. Um, so, but, but really good question. Uh, appreciate the, the, uh, yeah, just we're trying to think about this in a, in a well-rounded way. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're not, they're not really hunters. Um, and uh, so, so when not held together by resources or by human bonds and, and captivity, uh, their social structure is generally described um, uh, in, in a different way. Um, the, this phrase was coined by Dr. Ian Dunbar, who is... Uh, just like the, f we might call him like the father of modern dog training. Um, he's he's been very influential uh, in the way that we dog the we, the way that we train dogs today. Um, and uh, he's he's called them uh, called the the social structure more of uh, loose tra loose transitory association. So it's not that they don't hang out ever, not that they don't. Um, have some sort of relationships, but they don't form packs the way that we really think of them. Um, and hello, Limit. <laughs> um, yeah, glad to have you guys all here today. Um, yeah, so so on their own, without without us, dogs mostly do their own thing. <clears throat> um, but uh, it's it's important because because of um, because of where the whole uh, language, um, we'll call it, uh, and, and, and this uh, pack mentality kind of thing uh, came from wolf studies, it's important that let's, let's talk about wolves a little bit. So while, while humans, or while, while dogs share a common ancestor with wolves and nearly identical DNA, um, dogs are wolves no more than humans or chimpanzees. Our DNA is almost identical too. Um, Similarly, dogs, our, our canis familiaris, our domesticated dogs, are also not dingoes or jackals or African wild dogs or coyotes. Um, they are their own species. Um, yes, they are all canids. Um, and, and understanding their, the, sh the traits that they share with all of these different species helps us to know them better and, uh, and to be better able to take care of them and provide for their needs. Um, but understanding their fundamental differences is also really, really important. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and, and one of those ways is, is that they're not pack animals. So uh, dogs are not wolves, and, but this, this pack animal talk all came from wolf studies. So let's, let's clear that up. Um, even even wolf packs are different than you might think, that you might have been uh, told. Um, a wolf pack is just a nuclear family. It's a mama wolf and a papa wolf and their babies. Um, and when the offspring 
of mom and dad reach sexual maturity. Uh, some of them may disperse and go start their own packs. Um, and that's it. That's, there's, there's no fighting for rank because alpha is just mom and dad. Uh, they're, they're alpha because they're the parents. <laughs> um, and another, another uh, difference um, in b between wolves and dogs and, and another a little piece of, of evidence that I would say contributes to uh, not, not, not wanting to call dogs uh, pack animals is that with wolves, uh, the, the father, the, um, they, they participate in the rearing of offspring. Uh, dogs don't do that. <laughs> um, so that, that piece that would hold the, the family, the pack together, um, isn't really there. Dad would just leave anyway. Um, so yeah, um, male dogs just, they, they don't participate in rearing of offspring. And even uh, for, for wolves, for wolf biologists, um, they even prefer the term breeding pair over the term alpha. Um, some biologists don't, don't feel that it's really an accurate descriptor for even wolves. <laughs> um, and actually that term, alpha wolf, uh, came from uh, studies of captive wolves. Um, and, and yeah, like everything that we thought we knew about wolves and wolf behavior and wolf packs came from uh, these studies of a group of male, all male, captive, unrelated, unfamiliar dogs. Um, and then a book was written by a wolf biologist, Dr. David Meech, um, where he used the term alpha and explained what they thought, you know, what their findings were at the time. Um, and even the author of that book has expressed um, the wish that he could, we could kind of undo a lot of the um, a lot of the mythology and, and a lot of the misconceptions that we had about both wolves and dogs based on his own book. Um, because that, those terms and the, the training methods that, that came about because of it, um, a lot of it is inaccurate and a lot of it for our dogs is, is detrimental. Um, so yeah, it, those, those ideas, they just, they took off in pop culture and they spread like wildfire and it's so hard to take it back now. Um, say, she says, wow, Nietzsche, we got deep today. Yeah, today today we're going a little bit deep. Um, so <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, I think and it's interesting though, like, and and I don't know, that sometimes I think like, do the nuances matter? Some people may may not feel that they do, but I've got my reasons. And uh, and that's, we're, we're gonna come to that too. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so so all of this came from from these this study and these books or this book, and um, here's what we know now: uh, captive animals do not behave the same as they would in the wild, uh, just like humans in prison don't behave the same that we do when we're free. Uh, so assumptions about natural wolf behavior based on captive male unfamiliar wolves in unnatural groupings um, is a bit like saying that uh, we know this, we know X, Y, Z about human behavior because we did studies about male prison prisoners. Like that would be way off base. Like most of us do not act like that. <laughs> um, oh, CK, where are you going? <laughs> uh, traveling, huh? That's, that's exciting. Oh my gosh. Are things changing? <laughs> um, yeah. I'd love to hear about your adventures. Um, so, um, Yes. Um, in, in, so in both, in both of these scenarios, you know, the, the captive wolf groupings or in a human prison, um, space and food and mates are limited. Um, in a scenario like that, you are going to see more fighting. Um, but that's, that's not necessarily indicative of behavior in natural environments and in natural social groups. Um, Furthermore, species that do have stable dominance hierarchies, um, the goal of those hierarchies is to reduce fighting. Um, but besides that, dogs are not wolves and dogs are not pack animals. So 
we're, we're, we're basing it off of, off of a totally different species behavior. Uh, oh, CK flying home. Oh, I'm sorry. Not under good circumstance. Oh, your brother passed away. I am so sorry, but thank you for being willing to share that with us. I, I feel bad for asking now, but, um, oh gosh. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, but yes, I hope I, we have a safe flight and thank you for joining while you can. Um, we'll, we'll catch you later. Um, okay. All right, guys. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, not, <laughs> thanks guys for, for showing support. <laughs> that's, that's, mm. oh God, I get so awkward around, around tragedy. I'm so sorry. Um, all right. So dogs, let's get back to dogs, back to dogs. Dogs are not wolves. Dogs are not pack animals, but what dogs are, are very social animals. Uh, this is this is different from a pack. Um, many dogs, but not all, uh, enjoy interaction with other members of their species. Mm, they can live harmoniously among humans and among other dogs and even among other species. Um, but even even in our uh, human dominated world, um, in my experience, dogs for the most part, do best in dyads, uh, meaning one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one-on-one -on -one dog play is the best recipe for success. Um, when, when there's more, the more dog, <laughs> the more dogs that join a group, um, the more potential there is for unrest. Um, because it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe it, but but yeah, from from what I see, um, dogs who could get along with all these different dogs individually, um, that one-on-one -on -one play just goes a lot better. Um, doesn't mean that it's the only way. Plenty of dogs can get along with a variety of dogs all at once. Um, but um, outside of of those dogs, who you know, who might be attending daycare or puppy classes or boarding or uh, situations like that. Um, a lot of dogs, they merely tolerate it, or maybe they don't even tolerate it. A lot of dogs uh, are are put under a lot of stress by being in those situations because it is unnatural, um, and for that individual dog, may not be the best way to spend their time. Um, so, so yeah, for for a lot of dogs, being thrown together uh, in a group of unrelated, maybe even unfamiliar individuals can be super stressful. Um, Scott has a question. So if dogs are not pack animals, does that mean there is no such thing as an alpha? Um, mm, it's a really good question, Scott. So I, I like to be careful about, um, speaking in absolutes, um, and saying no such thing as an alpha, I can't really say. Um, but are we talking about alpha among a group of dogs? Are we talking about uh, alpha uh, among your dog and your family? Um, do uh, alpha among any species? Um, what I know today is that among the species where we might have used the term alpha, biologists who work in those fields tend to opt not to use that term. Um, so that's, that's the whole, uh, biology ethology world. Um, but among, in the dog training community, uh, and, and for dogs, the term alpha is not helpful. Um, I, I don't know if I would just flat out say like, there's no such thing as an alpha, but I do know that for the average dog and the average dog owner, that term is is unhelpful it, it it's at, at best it's unhelpful at worst it's actually does a lot of damage <laughs> um scott says i have two dogs and one of our dogs is definitely more of an alpha in their relationship um and the way that dogs navigate social dynamics um provides a lot of fodder for people wanting to label them as alpha or as dominant um and well, I, I can see, um, I can see why, 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 why we would say things like that. Um, and, and in fact, I hear it 
pretty much any time I go out into public and am around other people with dogs, you know, I'll, I'll overhear conversations where people are using these terms. Um, but in most situations, I, you know, there's, there's a more helpful way to talk about the behavior um, with, with behavior professionals. Um, when, when, if there's, if there's a problem, you know, when we, when we want to go in and intervene and try and change the dynamic, the dynamic or change behavior, um, we want to be more descriptive and more specific and labels like that don't really help us um, because they can be, um, uh, they can be defined differently by different people. Um, and it, yeah, it just, it kind of, it can, it can lead people off track. Um, and uh, if you, depending on who you listen to, <laughs> it can lead people to, to use training methods that will be counterproductive for your goals. So yeah, that's, that's where I stand on it. <laughs> but thank you so much for your questions. This is, this is exactly why uh, we want to talk about these things. Um, so yeah, let's, let's keep going. Um, all right. Uh, this is, this is a perfect segue, Scott. Thank you so much. Um, so there are, there are some other things that will happen among groups of dogs that can, can be a little confusing. Um, and, uh, sometimes, you know, this is, these kinds of behaviors are described as like packing up, uh, by some people, which lends you know, what, what you'd think would be more evidence to the dogs are pack animals theory. Um, but, um, there, yeah, there, there are times that you might see dogs do things that look pack like, um, dogs, as I said, they do retain some of the old behavioral software, um, from their ancestors, but rather than slapping the pack label on it, um, there are better, more nuanced explanations um, that give us a better vocabulary. Um, so rather than pack behavior, I would might say, you know, it's, it's a specific form of social behavior. Um, this may sound like an unnecessary distinction, but because men, pack mentality uh, on our part hurts dogs, uh, and, and because we want to be accurate around here, um, we're going to talk about things like social facilitation. Um, that is a term that uh, is the tendency for an animal to behave as others of their species are behaving in a given moment. Um, so you're probably familiar with this uh, when people around you are yawning. Um, dogs do this too. Um, other examples of dogs, um, so socially facilitated dog behavior might be barking or howling or chasing. Um, these are behaviors that just because one dog is doing it, another dog might join in. Um, it's a, it's a social behavior, but not necessarily a pack behavior. Um, uh, and, and we can say this because it happens lots among species that don't live as packs, P species that are social species, um, but don't, we would never describe them as, as a pack animal. Um, another... Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, Margaret says, as a behavior observer of children, I think what you're saying about the canine species is spot on <laughs> and you have moxie. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, no Limit says, ma'am, I am an animal of my own. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we, we, sh we should be, right? Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so that was social physics excuse me, social facilitation. Um, and another example of a, of a social behavior um, is something called local enhancement. And that is when uh, a resource draws dogs to, uh, to, to a, a certain area um, or the presence of dogs draws dogs to that, that location to investigate what's going on. Um, this might be something like uh, if if you saw some random person standing around looking up at the sky or weirdly like staring down at the ground for a long time, like you might be curious enough to like wander over and look up or stare at the ground too. Like what's happening? What are you doing? <laughs> um, or uh, if you've ever been witness to um, a flash mob, um, that's, that's the kind of thing where like something interesting is happening and people start to, to, walk over there and just to see what's going on and more people join and more people join. It doesn't mean that you would call us pack animals. Um, it's just that something drew a lot of animals to that spot. 
Um, so yeah, uh, using dogs' social behavior as evidence that they're pack animals is uh, a bit anti-intellectual, maybe? Uh, I don't know if that's going too far, but... <laughs> um, but, you know, on the other hand, like, who cares? Like, does does this really matter for you and your dog? <laughs> no Limit says, I would tap them on the head. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, would you? Like... <laughs> It's if if this ever happens to you again, you'll like, you'll laugh because it's it's just funny. You're like, what's what's going on when people are behaving in ways that you're like, hmm? <laughs> especially especially when it has to do with our gaze, like where we are looking, um, draws us to 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 check it out. It's so it's it's a funny thing that happens. Um, so uh, yeah, so. I think it does matter uh, this this discussion about this language, um, and and that's that's why I talk about it. <laughs> um, our word choices affect how we think about and how we interact with our animals, um, and just like uh, if you were here the other day, you know, I I like to use the term cue instead of the word command uh, when I talk about the the words and hand signals that I teach my dog because. Uh, Q and command, they, they imply uh, a different mechanism backing up the behavior, um, backing the motivation behind it. Um, so if instead of pack, I, I prefer to just swap it out for terms like group or family or crew. Uh, you know, um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't try and like take the, the term pack back, um, but as it is, pack is kind of laden with all of these ideas about alphas and dominance and this hierarchy and um, needing to be a leader. Uh, and, and along with those concepts come some training recommendations that can hurt your relationship with your dog and, and hurt your dog's welfare. Um, and a lot of like, I mean, I I hate to harp on it all the time, but um, these are these are methods that are common, and there are still people who call themselves dog trainers out there recommending these methods, and they can they can ruin your dog, like they can do irreparable damage, um, and I just I want to save as many people from that and, and as many dogs from that as I possibly can. Um, so yeah, and and talk about packs and, and alphas and dominance, you know, especially when they're uh, talked about on TV shows by these reality show dog trainers, you know, they're, they're continuing to spread this, this misinformation and we have to help people. <laughs> um, so uh, No Limit says, I'm not saying abuse, but verbal wise, he knows. Are you talking about tapping the guy on the head still? <laughs> I no what no. We would we wouldn't think that at all. <laughs> um yeah, so um yeah, so so in here's here's another interesting thing. So when if you if you look at this through the biology lens or the ethology lens, which is the study of behavior, um animals that behave in the ways that are recommended by the leadership and the dominance philosophies um, are actually perceived by their peers as being lower ranking, having less status, being weaker. Um, true leaders, if you really think about it, uh, think about the people um, in your life, in your world, uh, who you think of as like a true leader. And compare that with the people who maybe are in positions or of authority um, but who you would not describe as a leader. Um, that's, that's kind of what happens. Um, true leaders don't need to show off their strength and their power. Uh, they are calm and cool and collected and efficient. You know, only, they only take action when it's really necessary. Um, they are not unnecessarily possessive or aggressive. Uh, that, that is the point of having rank, is that you don't need to show it off. Uh, 
lower lower ranking members of a group are generally the ones who act out thinking you know and and are like looking for a fight or have something to prove uh because only those insecure about their status feel the need to waste their time and energy reminding others of it uh so think about that next time someone tells you that you need to show your dog that you're the leader you're the alpha your dog knows. Your dog knows that you control everything in their life. You are the one who provides the food. You are the one who opens the doors. You are the one who gives them access to playmates, to the dog park, to the bathroom even. You control everything about your dog's life and they know it. You don't have to prove anything. Um, <laughs> oh, no limits. No, just being verbal. I'm an Aries. I could show off if I wanted to. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Um, so, uh, yeah, like, like I said earlier, you know, the, the role of dominance hierarchies among species who have them um, is to reduce the amount of, of, of aggression in a social group. Uh, animals that display aggression over resources um, know that it's dangerous. It, it puts them at risk of, of injury or even death. Um, and animals generally want to avoid being injured or killed. <laughs> um, thinking of this in, a, in an evolutionary context, um, animals that put themselves at higher risk of, of being injured or killed um, generally don't live long enough to reproduce, um, which means that those genes are going to not not be um, as big a percentage in the gene pool in general, right? Um, so animals generally want to avoid conflict. Um, so, so in order to achieve this among social species uh, who find interaction um, among other, uh, other members of their species um, have evolved different, different types of dominance hier hierarchies. Um, we, we possibly tend to think of just one type of dominance hierarchy, which is linear. You've got alpha, then you've got beta, and there's one after the other. And, you know, and if, if B is higher ranking than D, then D is lower ranking than C, you know, like just, just very linear. Um, but that's actually not the only type of dominance hierarchy that exists in the wild. Um, and interestingly, um, among species that have them, uh, there are s uh, some hierarchies that are better dis better defined as um, sub submission hierarchies, right? Um, where it's not uh, higher ranking animals forcing their will on lower ranking animals. Um, it's that lower ranking animals actually just offer up submission um, because again, lots of species would prefer to avoid conflict. So if I just volunteer, like, hey, no problem, you can always go first. Like, um, in a species that that has those hierarchies, um, sometimes it doesn't work top down, it works bottom up. Um, so that's, that's worth looking into too. Um, okay, Scott, thanks for joining while you could. Enjoy your dinner. <laughs> Send some for the rest of us, I'm starving. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah, so, so social species have evolved different types of hierarchies um, in order to reduce conflict so that resources can be allocated uh, without having to have a fight over it every single time, right? Um, but the thing is, we don't, we don't observe any of these types of stable hierarchies among groups of dogs. Uh, with dogs, who is who is displaying the types of behaviors that you might label as dominant um, can shift and change even moment to moment. Now, uh, sometimes, um, like Scott pointed out earlier, if he's got two dogs at home and generally only one is um, is displaying those those types of behaviors generally, um, it, you know, you might, you might think like, oh, well, this is dominant. He's an alpha, you, you know, um, but there may come a day when a resource is more important to the other dog and that, you know, they may stand up for themselves. Um, and if you, if you spend a lot of time, like I do, <laughs> observing many different dogs um, over a, a lot of time, 
um, you'll see like, and I've actually seen this, you know, in, in one trip to a dog park, um, listened to uh, a couple, you know, talking about their dog and saying how dominant he was because he did something. I think it was, you know, like, like stood over another dog or pinned another dog down um, in, in play. Um, and then not 10 or 20 seconds later, the dog's had reversed roles um, and it keeps switching back and forth. Um, what, what we observe in dogs is that who displays that type of behavior um, depends on what the resource is, how badly the, the dogs in question want it, um, and, and it changes. It changes moment to moment, day to day, dog to dog, changes all the time. Um, so yeah, it's, there's, there just does not tend to be a, a stable static uh hierarchy among groups of dogs um and i you know like i've i've spent several years now um walking groups of dogs uh i have colleagues um who i've walked with them and observed their groups of dogs working um in a in a puppy school teaching classes and running play groups and seeing lots of different uh groups of dogs play and interact. Um, and I've not seen it. I've not seen anything that is stable enough to be called a hierarchy. Um, uh, yes. So anyway, so yeah, we, we assume <laughs> this, uh, this pack animal statement to, to be true because it gets repeated all the time in, in books, TV, movies, uh, your neighbors, like it, it just, it gets repeated over and over and over again. Um, so it's easy uh, to just assume that it must be true. Um, but have you ever, have you ever encountered anything else that you maybe thought was true and then changed your mind about later? I actually, I'm really curious to know this. Um, do you guys have good examples? Doesn't have to be dog related at all. Um, but curious to know, was there anything that you would just ever believed your whole life um, until adulthood, and then one day someone informed you it wasn't true. Like I think I've had, I'm, I'm I mean, aside from the pack stuff, because I thought this forever too. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of of another example, but I know that there's been there's been many many moments like this where I'm like, like what? Like I have always thought X Y Z is true. And like, how could it not be, you know? Um, in a lot of cases, it's just like a silly random fact and it doesn't matter too much. But in some cases, there are implications. Um, and and this is, this I think is one of them. Um, so so when we assume, and, and, and here's, here's the rub, right? When we assume that the, the pack animal statement is true, um, there are, there are three big, uh, three big repercussions of this. One is that we often put dogs into situations that they would not choose on their own. Um, meaning dogs who are not particularly social with dogs, um, being sent to playgroups, daycares, things like that, um, or being taken to the dog park when they're not really dog park dogs. Um, so we, we put them in situations that they just wouldn't choose. Uh, and it, it increases their risk for, of them having a conflict. Um, and nobody, nobody ever feels good about that. Right. Um, no limit says, Hey, I read a lot of stuff that I do not believe. And I sit back and watch, you know what? I think that sitting back and watching is a really good strategy. And in most areas, I'm trying to do a lot more of that. I, I have, um, yeah, just try to figure it out. I have been in, in my life, I have been very um, quick to quick to jump in, quick to make assumptions, quick to uh, just be argumentative and confrontational. And I will tell you this: that has never served me well. Um, so as I as I grow and mature, uh, I'm I'm trying to do more of your strategy: just sit back, watch, learn, um, until I feel like I know enough to be able to speak knowledgeably about it. Um, and I feel like I can with, with the, with the dog pack stuff. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so one, we put dogs into situations that they would not otherwise choose to be in. Two, we employ training techniques that um, to establish ourselves as the leader, um, which are counterproductive to our training goals and harmful to our bond with our dog. Uh, and three, um, we, we prevent ourselves from understanding who they really are uh, and thereby how best to meet their needs. Um, and I, I think that's important. Like I, I, I feel better, uh, like I feel like I'm a better dog parent um, when, I, when I really understand my dogs. Like the more I've learned, um, the more I feel like I can see them in just uh, a different lens or, or just, you know, it's like, like if, if you wear glasses, like if, if you just didn't, didn't go from, you know, being totally blind to putting on glasses and being like, oh, I can see. But if you got just progressively slightly better lenses over and over, and it just kind of cleared things up, like that's how I feel my experience has been as I've learned more about dogs. Um, and it, it just allows me to be more um, accurate and more, um, just, just more helpful, really, uh, to my dog. Um, and the ways that I've been able to interact with, with Dizzy since getting him, it just, it kind of blows my mind, like, what we've been able to accomplish. Whereas, had I, had I gotten him um, without, without learning anything more about dogs, um, you know, We'd have, I don't know, we'd probably have been fine because I, I hope, I hope that I would not have chosen to, um, to put any equipment on him or use any methods that, that would hurt him. But I don't, I can't say that. I can't say that I wouldn't have, um, without learning more about why you shouldn't, you know? I mean, I, and I, if I, I've always been an animal lover, like, it's not that, like, I would never have done that stuff because, like, I don't like animals and I don't care about how they feel, but, but I might not have thought through like the implications. Um, I don't know because I like, unlike a lot of dog trainers who, um, trained, you know, using those methods and then got additional education and decided to change the way that they train. I came into this, um, profession, um, kind of with a fresh slate. You know, I was, I just sought out a training school. Um, and luckily, uh, I learned, I learned what I learned about the, the best ways to train. Um, and so I, I never went down that road. Um, but I can't say that I wouldn't have, you know, it just, it was the luck of the draw. Um, <laughs> no limit says, Hey, you're smart. Don't take my words for feelings. Um, I mean, we learn as we go, right? Like I, <laughs> we do, we do the best we can with what we know in a moment. And uh, when we know better, we do better. Yeah, I love that quote so much. Um, so yeah, so, so what do you guys think? Do you, um, does, does this resonate with anybody? I, I'm really curious to know, like one, do you think it matters? Do you think it would make any difference uh, in your relationship with your dog? Or do you think that having this discussion with with the public at all like do you think that it would it's a good idea um do you think it matters to to anybody else um i don't know um are there are there questions that you still have that are left unaddressed about behavior that you've seen um bring them on guys i i you know like like i said i'm it's all learning is a journey and i will continue to learn as i go um this this is what i know today. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and I've, and I've seen how it benefits, um, my own interactions, uh, my own life with, with my dog and with the dogs that I interact with. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious to know if, if, uh, was it interesting at the very least? <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> just, um, I don't know, like, I, I find reading about this kind of stuff really interesting, and so I get excited to share it, um, but I, I need your feedback, I need to know, like, is, would, is more of this stuff 
the kind of content that you'd like to hear about. Um, are there actually, are there other things that we haven't talked about on this show that you would like to see brought up? Um, I would love suggestions, you guys. Um, you know, you know, it can be, it can be hard sometimes to come up with topics. So, um, and plus I want to, I want to talk about what you guys want to hear about. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, limit, <laughs> you're learning this, you're doing fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I don't know. I know, I know what I know. And, uh, that's, that's it. That's it. Dizzy, what do you think, huh? I'm just licking your private parts down there. Would you like to join the party? He got a bath yesterday. He had a big day yesterday. We, we had a vet appointment and a trip to the dog park and, uh, and a bath. It was a big, <laughs> it was a big day. Um, say, says, suggestion, how to handle doggo conflict with humans and with other dogs. That's a good one. Um, I wonder if, if we should make that like one, one episode or, or if we should talk about different types of conflict. Um, cause we talked, we, I did, uh, we did talk about the resource guarding that can be a, a common, uh, type of conflict. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> dog, dog is, has, has arrived. The real question are, are pack animals cats? And I think, I think cats are definitely more loners, but I'm definitely not a cat expert. So, but maybe, we, hey, there's a good idea. This is a good, this is a good idea. Maybe we could have a cat expert on. Ooh, actually, I like this idea. That was, that was very nice. I think we're going to, we're going to do that one day. Who wants to hear about cat stuff? <laughs> um, Say so says another suggestion, how to reprimand doggos with the Malloway method. Uh, I mean, when a doggo misbehaves, how to handle that in a humane way without hitting dogs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a really good one too. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to write these down right now because I have a list. Say gets all the credit for suggesting handling dog, dog, human and dog, dog conflicts and how to handle dog misbehavior. Is that, that's what we'll call it. Uh, I have no dealing with cats. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't either for the most part. Um, not that I don't like cats. I love cats. I had a cat and I loved being a cat mom. Um, but I don't think David's gonna let me have a cat. So unfortunately, um, I don't get to have personal experience with cats at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about them. It could be interesting because I know people who train cats and I'll tell you this, the, the training methods are the same. Um, it, it might look a little bit differently because cats move a little bit slower and might be motivated a little bit differently, but they can absolutely, absolutely learn some cool stuff. And I think it'd be really fun to talk about. Um, Say says, I would love to hear about cat stuff. I don't know the first thing about cattos. Oh yes. Let's put that on the list. Cat stuff by... Doggus P. Hoggus. Is that, am I saying that right? <laughs> um, Doggus says that he plays b-ball with them. Oh, the old newspaper always works. Ah, uh, yes. We will talk about different ways to handle dog misbehavior. I like that topic. That's a good one, say. Um, thank you guys for the suggestions. This is, this is good. Uh, you should review dog toys too. I would love recommendations as some are just terrible no matter the brand. Choking hazards and all. Beautiful, beautiful. This is great. This is good, guys. Uh, toy reviews. That means we're gonna have to go shopping, I think. Dizzy's gonna love that. <laughs> we might have to make that um, more uh, recorded video. I don't know. I don't know how, like, we could do that as a live stream. Um, but yeah. Karen, will you be doing a, a show on potty training your fur baby? My neighbor is having a hard time with her fur baby. So Karen, I'm so glad you said that because I was thinking about doing a potty training show next week um, and I just wasn't sure if that was uh, a pressing issue for anyone. So now that you've said that, I probably will. Um, 
yes, Kong, <laughs> Kong is good dog toys. <laughs> Kong is my favorite, you guys. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, I'll, I'll tell you this, you, and, cause you may never, never have known this, but Kong is like, not only do they make excellent, excellent products. This is like the tiniest Kong ever. Actually, it's not. This is a small and they do make extra small if you can believe it. Like I never thought that a, you would need a Kong this small. This is tiny. Generally, uh, when you are choosing the right size of Kong for your baby, you want to size, shoot larger. Um, aim for the largest, largest or, or larger than you think. Um, cause the, the, like the, the really most common size Kong that I see is the large, which I always thought it would have been a medium. I don't know why I assumed that, but anyway, always size up. Uh, but not only are their products like amazing and quality and they just, they put a lot of thought into production, but it's also just like a really, really good company. I have been, um, in contact with a representative at Kong um, about how to how to better um, communicate about their products because I really really love the values that they stand for and just how they operate like they are they're one of those companies you really want to support um, so yeah huge fan um, <laughs> no limit says <laughs> Okay, yes, No Limit says, what am I looking at, ma'am? I know what this looks like, but there's a story. Okay, I'll tell you the story. So, and let me go, I'm gonna go get some more for you because I have, I happen to have a lot. <laughs> um, and if you're, if you don't have a dog or if you're not familiar with the classic Kong, this may look a little sketch, right? Um, but it actually, uh, it actually came from, yes, dog has to take food from it. <laughs> no limit. You are cracking me up, man. Um, so the, the con, so this actually, uh, came, I believe, I hope I'm not getting this wrong. Cause that would be, that would be bad, bad Jennifer. Um, but the inventor of the Kong, uh, was just fed up with his dog, like, always getting into stuff and chewing on things he wasn't supposed to. And I think the story is that one day he like took out, like, I, I, I want to say it was like a car part or something that was rubberized and shaped kind of like this. Um, and he just like threw it for his dog and the way that it kind of bounced around erratically and the dog loved it, um, got him thinking about making a dog toy out of it. So, and originally they weren't even, they weren't even used, um, for putting food in. They were just used to be like used as a toy or like a ball. Um, because the, the erratic way that they bounce is really fun for a lot of dogs. So that's the way they, they were used for years, maybe even decades, I want to say. Um, and since then, uh, we have, they've, perfected the the rubber that they use they've made different um different uh, durabilities of rubber so the the red is the classic um, but if you've got super chewers um, they make black kongs which are even tougher um, and the way that i use them most commonly now is we they we fill them up with food let the dog get the food out um and there's different ways that you can stuff them and freeze them so that it's varying levels of difficulty for the dogs um and oh and of course like another fun fact um they're called kong uh because the guys the owners um I, his friend said that he thought it looked like like an earplug for king kong so <laughs> that's why they called it kong um earplug no limit earplug. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, they, they, they have a variety of sizes. Um, so I think this is the, this is the extra, extra large. That's the large. So there's one in between and then you've got the medium, which is actually pretty tiny and then small and then teeny tiny small. Um, so, so yeah, depending on you, you want to choose Choose your Kong based on the size of your dog. So smaller dogs can get away with smaller Kong, but again, always size up. <laughs> um, I honestly don't 
don't know why you would ever need an extra small Kong. Maybe the small. I got this because we were going to get the palm puppy and she was going to weigh like three pounds. So um, that's why I bought that. But anyway, one day, one day we'll get the palm. Um, Say says, I have four dogs and no Kongs. Can you believe that? I'm going to consider them now. Do it. Do it. I, I said on Monday, like, I think every dog owner should have at least three. Uh, one one in use, one that's prepped and ready to go, and one that's being cleaned um, so that you have a constant rotation. That's how much I love these guys. Um, so say, I mean, you wanted <laughs> you wanted toy reviews. You got it today, man. Um, I will... Uh, I will definitely, we'll go shopping. We'll do some more toy reviews. Um, let me know what you guys want us to check out. I, I love that idea. I get, actually got to put it on the list too. No, I already did. Ah, whew, all over the place today. Okay. Um, Jose Whoa. Rodriguez, new follower. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's see. Uh, welcome Rudy. Did I miss Rudy joining? Oh, hi, Rudy. <laughs> Another new follower. Thank you guys so much for being here. This has been a really fun show. Um, let's see. Oh, no way. Your neighbor works for Kong. You get a bunch of dog toys. That is so cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, I, I cannot, cannot recommend Kong highly enough. Um, doggo shopping for the win. Hell yes. <laughs> Dizzy, what do you think about that? He's busy. He's busy barking at dogs out the window at the moment. Um, hey, Diz. He's a, he's a bit of a, a watchdog barker here. Hi, cutie. Can you say hi? Say hi to the new followers. Can you say hi? <laughs> His, his box isn't, isn't placed appropriately today. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is super fun. Thanks for the, the suggestions, guys. Um, and if you, like I said, if you've got toys that you want us to check out, say, um, there's, there are always new products, new dog toys, new pet products on the market that I, you can't possibly keep up with everything. So if there's stuff that you guys have seen, um, let us know what we should check out. We, I'd love to check it out. Um, Rudy says my dog, my dog barks while I'm streaming too. You know, you would think Rudy that I'd have learned to shut the blinds while I'm streaming by now. Uh, but I just, I, I have to open them all the time cause I love the natural light and and I just forget, and then, and then he does this at the most inopportune moments. Um, but look at him sitting over there on his box. Yeah, goof. Here, I gotta toss him. We we play this game where I try and fail at tossing him treats over my <laughs> over my shoulder so that I can like talk to you guys as I'm rewarding my dog for being where I want him to be. So let's let's see. Did you guys see that? Oh, I actually got one. Missed. Okay. Well, <laughs> it was it was bound to happen. Um, say says mine too. And phone calls. Ah, it's so hard to remember sometimes to like turn everything off, shut the blinds. Um, I would just put my dog out of the room, but uh, I don't know. I think you guys kind of like seeing him. He's he's the true star of the show here. Um, so I like to I like to let him do whatever he wants. As long as it doesn't involve barking. <laughs> hey, Diz. Hop up. Thank you. We're going to try this again. We got a, we got a few more throws. Because um, this is my practice. I, I forget to practice when you guys aren't here with me. So um, you get to see how. <laughs> I think I'm getting better, though. Like, I didn't. That might have been the first one I made. I can't remember if. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I am getting better. <laughs> <laughs> no limit says he is looking at you like what the hell lady he looks at me like that a lot <laughs> um ooh yes say says another show suggestion service doggos i don't know much about that but i would love to learn more that would probably be another good one for me to bring on a guest because i know a little about um about service dogs but Probably I could bring you somebody who knows a lot more, but that would be a really good idea. Oh, you are gold today, say. How much do I owe you for this? 
<laughs> I feel like this has been so helpful. Um, Karen says he needs his airtime with his mommy. He does. He's a bit of a show off and um, an attention hog, if if I may. Mm, okay, need a little more more oomph in my throw here. Hop up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Did did you get that one? That was two in a row, I think. Hell yeah. No, maybe I'm. <laughs> you guys saw it. You probably saw me miss there. All right. Last ones, Diz. You ready? I know he's like half off screen, but you can see him. You can see him catch. <laughs> if I miss, he gets off the box. That's how it goes. Mm. <laughs> I can get like one in a row. I have to like really, really aim. Hop up. <laughs> yes. And here we go, two in a row, two in a row. Uh, next time, guys, next time. Friday, I will be able to get two in a row. It just takes practice, right? <laughs> I need I need training, I need tr throwing training. <laughs> um, all right, thank you guys so, so much for hanging with me today and for all of your awesome suggestions, um, definitely. Go out and get yourself a Kong if you don't have one, because I love these, and I'm I don't get I don't get commission for this, guys. I promise. Um, at Liar. least at least, <laughs> at least not yet. Uh, Kong, if you wanna. <laughs> no. Um. Cool. Thank you guys uh, again. I will see you on Friday. Have a good evening.